been looking forward to, uh, to our poet tonight. Um, we're delighted to have Don Diaz-Willis uh, here. I heard Don read at uh, Penelope Schott's uh, White Dog uh, Salon. Uh, she holds an, uh, an MFA from the University of Oregon and has been the recipient of a literary arts fellowship. She served as a, an editor with uh, Early Press and her, uh, her most recent book is an Early Press book, uh, which is uh, Still Life with Judas and, and Lightning. Her work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in the Iowa Review, Southern Poetry Review, Poet Love, and elsewhere. Her poetry has been part of the uh, co collaborative art shows with photographer Barry, Barry Shapiro and visual artist Anne Kresge. Her book, which is, I just held up, uh, was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award in 2015. So we're in for a treat tonight. Uh, would you help join me in welcoming our poet for this evening, Don Diaz-Willis. Hello, everyone. I am so pleased to be here. Um, thank you for having me. I have never been to Milwaukee before. It's all new to me, and I think it's charming and adorable. And, and it's amazing that, there's, that there are all these wonderful poetry events that are happening in your community. Um, so tonight, I will be reading from, oh, excuse me, that's probably great on the video, okay. Um, I will be reading from Still Life with Judas and Lightning, and the book is, the book is a little bit dark, as the, as the title suggests. I would describe it as a meditation on suffering and its relationship with the sacred. Nobody gets out of life without suffering generally, and some more than others. And so the book looks at um, these moments, um, some large and some small, in which uh, individual characters face these pivotal moments in their lives. And what I hope to do is kind of crack those moments so that you get a peek inside at, at the mystery that is inside those moments. And my, my sort of um, archangel, as I imagine him for the book, is Paul Salon, whose work I adore, um, and who is a master at um, creating beauty out of great darkness. And the book begins with an epigraph from Flower. The stone, the stone in the air which I followed, your eye as blind as the stone. We were hands. We bailed the darkness empty. We found the word that ascended summer, flower. The first poem I'll read from the book um, is about the power of love and family even when those who should care for us and love us have wounded us. And it's called Second Week in Foster Care. Am I too close to, um, okay. Okay, I'm not used to mics. All right, Second Week in Foster Care. Days are quiet, nights too. Still, they have a mother somewhere, riven and ravaged, lost to them. Both want her back, want to sit on her lap, grasp at the gray smoke forced through her lips, smell the ammonia salt of her skin. They want their own mother, blood bonded and love hobbled, the mother of fault and foil and belt, the woman with the story of their birth and some afternoons together in ease. She is theirs and they are hers even as they sleep in their new mother's home. One child's mouth is stoppered in a pink pacifier. Another tugs his ear reflexively in dreams. They do not yet want the woman who watches over sleep, changes wet sheets or folds tired clothes, that almost mother who took the call in the dark to receive them each barefoot, each carrying a paper bag and a seamed, speechless animal. Mm -hmm. 
This next poem um, is a child's reaction to hearing that image, that um, important biblical image of Eve being kind of plucked out of Adam. And it's called Lacey Learning Eve. Home from church, she thinks of what she's heard. A woman not yet occurred, sealed inside, a sea of bone waiting to be plucked out by the voice of the tide. Could a woman be a rib? She could, they'd said. The man's body holding her in place like one string of a violin. Near Eve's ear, Adam's liver sang its pond of songs. Let the future's music muffle through. Lacey puts her pillow lightly over her face. Her closed eyelids sparkle with colored gnats, a scattering of notes. No father sang the song of her name or ever plucked her up from the day's design. She is only her mother's child, but she is also the little morsel waiting to be called out from an unlit, unchosen place, where she lives as if in a cistern of sound, where she is fastened like the nameless leaf of a tree. I'm, I'm really interested in the common experience that people have uh, when someone they love dies and they experience them in the atmosphere, lights, sort of flickering of lights takes on a different feeling. Sometimes you see a bird and you think that these are messages. People start to feel that there are messages and then in certain cultures and belief systems, the dead are among us all the time. So this poem is a little bit about that. Socorro at the Pond. Socorro comes to wade and listen hard ankles parting drifts of foam. Her whole skin remembers floating with her sister in the pond behind their grandmother's house, the taste of green water, and the walk home together, towel draped and famished. A damselfly steps across the surface, born to do so. If she could, Socorro would too, sure that would be the height required to hear, to know what her sister wants to say in that light, that wind, that rustle of unspeaking things. The steps of the damselfly's needle legs form radiating circles on the water, filigreed in scum, verdigris, and tiny eggs. This is where her sister's voice lives now, rustle and hum, cicada tide at twilight, circles that move out toward life. Friday night wake in June. Mother's body lies cooling, dusk gilding her a little. Brother and sister refuse to hold hands like good orphans. The girl has the open silvery look of a fish. She twitches in the patio pool of evening, weaving between the stalks of neighbor's legs. Somewhere now the boy hides in a tree in his good clothes, listening, watching the sun sink to bed. The girl shakes in her laced shoes. The mosquitoes don't care a stitch and fly through the bark smell of coffee. Grains of sugar collect on the cloth. Grief sounds all through the house. It is the sound of people eating. It is the sound of the sound behind words. Um, this next poem is based on an anecdote from my childhood. My um, parents, who did not stay married very long, um, were a little bit of a mismatch. My father came from a family of Christian scientists, and my mother did not. So. It's called Pneumonia and Smoke. <coughs> yeah. 
The broken bird of belief calls preacher, preacher, preacher from the lawn of childhood. Lynn thinks it accuses her as her thoughts do. You made the baby sick with dark thinking. Her husband, her mother-in-law agree and they pray together near the crib slats. They weed their thoughts, believe. Still, the baby girl wheezes, flutters fists. Lynn stands, takes up the girl, runs to the car. On the drive, examining her conscience, she tries to remove each wrong thought, but each returns, flies that will not be waved off. Past the sliding hospital doors, she seeks the stark declarations of prayer, struggles to construct her thoughts like little cathedrals of straw, and hands the baby to the wordless, white-clad nurse. To her left, she sees the smokers in their special room, their ashen cords reaching up to touch the hopeful ceiling tiles above their tired heads. When she joins them, the smokers do not ask her if she wants the baby to be sick. They are more practical. They believe in misfortune. <laughs> and uh, this next poem, I, I like to say that it's in honor of a vanishing sacred site, which is the drive-in. Um, I might not be alone in saying that rumor has it I was conceived at one. Some of you may also have that origin story, but maybe no one's admitted to it. But yeah. Okay. So it's and the name of it is based on an actual drive-in that's in San Diego, which is my hometown. Two View Drive-In Mission Beach. A berry field now paved over in asphalt, with poles at intervals emitting voices and a story enormous above the many vehicles parked in rows. The field could almost sigh beneath them. It had its own story once, bramble and foot traffic and pails stained in bright juice. Now, more than one girl a night looks over her boy's dark head to the blacktop sky and the moon, careless as a bared thigh above them all. The magic boxes fastened to the windows crackle and rasp sentences from those new futures, stories seeking root above the field. Um, this next poem um, is called Fidela at the San Felipe de Neri M Museum, and the image of the giant Christ with the leather um, hinges is an actual relic that you can see. <clears throat> Inside the museum, robes, christening gowns, ledgers, a tarnished censer, Ceiling beams like whole trees felled and risen horizontal. In the smaller back room, the walls are curved. A box draped in wrinkled fabric, color of eggshells, color of a nimbus, holds a life-sized marionette of Jesus. His puppet knees seem broken, stained in the cracks, thighs and shins separated. A note card clarifies. Jesus' knees weren't broken during the crucifixion. Leather straps allow his joints to bend. When Lent comes, parishioners will haul him onto their shoulders, carry him through the streets, create a finale affixing him to the cross at the altar by holes drilled into his limbs. Fidela puts her paper cup of coffee to her lips, looking down at him, wanting to peel him from his straw bed, heft him to her shoulder like an unwieldy baby, let his limbs clatter on the sunlit cobbles of Albuquerque, give freedom to what doesn't even live. There is nothing she believes in that will change anyone or free them. The book begins with a poem that um, kind of gathers all the players, all the different generations that 
could be part of any of the stories. And it's called Young Couple Marries in July. It also has an image of a, a seed inside a woman, and the book ends with that image as well, which I'll read that poem at the end. On their wedding day, white pellet rain of rice and clear light, her cheeks fruited, his smile guileless as bread. Some life before them the celebrants could taste, lavender and plum and a third element unnamed. The community bore gifts in colored boil, bowl, excuse me, in colored bowls and gleaming foil. The elders fanned flies. The children gambled, sugar-fed, and threw their shoes into the elm shade and ran away with shrieks of celebration. Bride and groom waltzed on a floor laid across summer grass. Between them, beneath white froth, beneath pretty girl fat and viscera, a spoonful of baby sat at the center. It was all for her, rice and light, flower and foil, flies and shrieks and limitless wonder across the grass. Sometimes we, especially when we're young, can um, romanticize um, criminals and romanticize violence a little bit. And this poem is called Billy Dreams He's Dillinger. See how it storms, how it roams inside, off the farm and into the streets. Infamy could be brought to the sternum, the eye, the halo of the self with its powdery gray wonder. Billy dreamed it, women in bright slips flanking him with their hidden tongues, their syrupy ennui, and him, colt, moonshine, and the stun of reeling half-lit through the day. Billy knew infamy could be had like ivory, like gold in the earth in the teeth of dead men. If it worked, they would say he walked handsome, radiant, with landscapes slaked with eternity, if it worked, a piece of beach from split bone and no mercy end to end. Billy climbed the roof at night, lay flat against the shingles, radiating the day's sun, felt the moon-fastened sky too huge above him. It stormed, roamed, and he feared nothing on this earth because he knew so little of it, his ignorance animating his lithe boy limbs. Infamy had, gangsters, gun malls would drive all night to the wasteland of his Kansas town, kneel in the dirt above him, break his tombstone into granite amulets, plant lit marlboros in the loose grass, and sprinkle the earth with cheap gin and ash, drop pocket change among the flowers, saying pesetas, pennies, tiny stars. I'd like to read a poem about the most famous zombie, and that would be Lazarus. Uh, and the inspiration of the poem is primarily the idea that if, if actually someone was risen from the tomb, what would people's actual reaction be? Not that, oh, I'm so glad he's back, or I, I can't process this, I don't know what to do. So it's more like that. Okay, when Lazarus comes back. Opening stiff eyelids, he sees the world again, the walls too white, the air too close with decomposing flesh. Coming to his senses, he reclaims the fine light surging in his eyes, the dust, sand, flakes of skin floating in his nostrils, the foul stewed taste of his own tongue, the hiss of wind moving in and out of stone, in and out of lung, the texture of minerals through the wrapped and rotting pads of his revived fingers. Sitting up on the stone where he was placed with hard grief and finality, Lazarus can see light where the sealed stone used to be. He can see a figure, barefoot, expressionless, waiting for him as the flat shape of a man. 
Sunlight pierces Lazarus as he steps toward the man, and the crowd, waiting for a miracle, hates the sight of Lazarus, hates the jerk of his walk, the dirty bandages blowing, his dumb surprise at rejoining them. Some scream, wail, cover their faces. Some lose their ability to speak and stagger home. Some throw sand until the air is alive with it. The figure holds out his hands to Lazarus, and the figure walks across the sand to meet him halfway. Welcome, someone says into his bandaged ear, and the crowd gathers its fear like a tool of the field and goes to work. I really believe in the power of art to save us. <laughs> um, I just, on so many levels, I think even if we don't make good art, just the practice of trying to make something beautiful out of our experience, out of what puzzles us, out of our, out of our dailiness and what we observe is so powerful. Um, it helps give meaning and um, and can be an incredibly healing healing practice. And that is another thread that runs throughout the book. And this poem is very specifically about that. It references Bernini's um, sculpture that you may be familiar with. It's very famous. I I want to say it's in the Vatican. I mean that may not be right. Um, but Saint Teresa of Avila is in ecstasy and, and she's in white, and then the, the these golden rods are shooting down at her from, and and there's also this little um, angel figure who's kind of ready to pierce her with the Holy Spirit, I guess, but I don't know exactly, but it's gorgeous. So it's called linseed oil. Green beans dangle in their window vines. Petunias insist their indigo beauties. Sometimes she paints them together. Sometimes half finished in her heart, bean and petal spill out of the frame unfinished. She loves or not. She is loved or not. The sunlight through the jar of linseed oil is her epiphany, its prism of yellow attention. The brushes prickling out of a water glass are Bernini's little rods toward Teresa. This poem is called Ruth Waiting, and the Ruth referenced is the uh, Ruth Ellis, who was the last woman hanged in England. Um, so. Almost day, she walks up the sidewalk, street lamp a sulking tulip, the trees a tangle of lime limbs in the yellowy dawn. She carries a sullen bouquet of last night's stockings and her shoes, like twin regrets. Inside, she turns on every lamp for the cops who are coming and plans to be dancing then, as she was when her sweetheart cleared the threshold. A customer, like any lover, pockets thick with money, his handsomeness swarming like drowsy bees. That dead man used to whistle like he knew what was coming, like the burning seeds of what love did to her were already tearing through his windpipe. When they danced, her dress lisped like petals, and he whispered, love is a slipknot of flowers, and laughed, misstepping. Then, after so many nights, he said, no more, into the receiver, and she was supposed to stay away, and didn't. When the police come, they'll ask her if her son heard anything. But who doesn't press their ear to plaster for those dark songs unraveling? Her boy always loved to sit amidst the blushing piles of crinoline, the garter belts and stockings strewn like bodiless women. What will become of him, she wonders, swaying as she looks out to the street, quiet as a new bride all petal skin, waiting to open.
this poem is a kind of anti-enunciation. Um, sometimes, um, well, you know, I do feel like there's, there are babies that come by accident that are wanted, and there are babies that come by accident that are not wanted, but that still remain. Um, that would be me. <laughs> but that's not what the poem is about. Um, but the poem is called, but it is about that situation. Um, and the poem is called Hagar and the Blue Jay at the Buena Vista Apartments. <laughs> the baby first comes to her as a dream of a blue jay streaming light. It is a warning about blessing and nature. Two bodies twine like purple clematis and the bargain grows. The couple settles, agrees without smiles, feels the linkage of the soul and gristle. Soon the woman holds the newborn swaddled in cotton. Everything is changed. There is no going back. The jay on the yellowed apartment lawn pecks the thoughtless insects and eyes her somehow. Though love is sometimes in her throat like a swallowed dime, there is something she wants and cannot name. She will always want it now. Her glass ashtray fills with gray powder of trying to know what some other life could be if she had not lain down like a little corpse of joy in the bird song. Hope everyone's taken their antidepressants before this reading. That's all I can say. So I'm not responsible. All right. Um, so, and speaking of antidepressants, um, if, well, okay, so this is a, a, a suicide averted. And actually this is, this poem is um, dedicated to my, my biological father. Keith decides to live anyway. Days accumulate behind him. Wind outside moves through leaves like rumination through memory. He has done certain things, and they stand at his back, an orchard of ambivalence, some shameful harvest. Unstoppable shafts of noon light bloom shards of coming rain. Days form an orchard, a corridor of bark and cycles. Acts has, have his name on them, his face, and it is the face he wants hidden beneath insects in the bark. Against one length of trunk, his hand tells stories of what's occurred, carved in with the tip of a broken stick, living's little map of the acre, what he did and what was done to him and other things that wouldn't fit. When he walks the orchard, it is twilight, his shadow attached, still faintly luminous. Trembling like the foliage, it limps past the pear trees, keeping him strange company. Shriveled cores alight with fading rays. Even as he walks, he is surprised to wonder, where isn't beauty hidden? Um, I, I really relate to the uh, New Testament story about Martha and Mary. Um, you know, there's the beautiful woman who's prepping and getting everything ready for the house guests, and then, which is Martha, and then Mary is sitting in with basically the men and listening to Jesus' teachings. And um, I come from a long line of Marthas who would be bitterly doing the dishes in the kitchen while miracles are going on in the next room and really be irritated about that. Um, so that's my people. So this is called Martha Observes Jesus Working. Between the dishes and the chickens roasting, she watches the healings, those brilliant amputations, those excisions of the spirit with pairings and rinds invisible. Each person comes to him, some tentative, some desperate, each quivering with hope and wounding. When it happens, the air wavers as if cooking fire smoke has risen up around them. Sometimes she thinks she sees him reach in and pull out the spine of suffering, translucent and tined, held up to the light for inspection and admiration. 
Deftly, each night, she guts a dinner fish, defeathers a hen, watches through the door space. Each seeker is a fish, a bird, that needs to be prepared. After supper, she wipes the crumbs, rinses the cups, sweeps the ash that is left, throws scraps of bone, skin, and organ to the hungry dogs. Just a couple more from this, from this book, and then I have, I'm going to read from a, a collaborative book that I'm working on. So this is... Um, you know, there's, there's Cain and Abel, we know about them, and then there was this next boy that came, Seth, that's little talked about, and that's the third son. So this is called Adam's third son. One son killed the other, everyone knew, but there was one more after, born in the shadow of grieving. The third boy had waited tucked behind his father's scapula. He had been a gleam across the grain and copper, the golden oil illuminated in the glass. He arrived at the sad hearth and cried his needs and awakened the family to the world that remains when the murdered and murderer have gone and we must eye each other carefully and keep tending to the sheep and the baby. So two more from this. The, this poem is third person sacred and it's really expresses the project of the book. Sometimes you know a person's story, or a piece of it, one sliver of the muscle examined for its striations and color. Sometimes you think of your own story, and it is both familiar and not, and you must question the details, the slant, the cant of its little roof and shutters, the home of what you know about yourself, your people, the city, the schools and afternoons that made you. There is someone in your field of vision. Maybe it is you. Light spills down on the diorama, and something has brought you here to witness the holy moment, any moment, with the gulls overhead like sticks tossed suddenly skyward and crossing beneath the biting blueness of the sky. The last poem I'll read from the book is the last poem in the book called Plum. She has followed the caravan of mystery, stumbled behind, wide-eyed, eating the crumbs as they fell. She has watched someone making miracles, corpse, water cask, maps of lesions, empty net, and suddenly her little soul appears, housed in her body like the pit of a plum, gnarled, intricate, a perfect whorl within the orange damp, or like the glistening gospel of viscera within the slit fish, readied for supper. Something waiting for a new use, ready to be seen. She waits to understand, but she does not. So she returns home. <clears throat> Lavender still brushes the crooked steps. The table is still the same silent square beyond the yard and an ending field and fruit ready for gleaning. Plums have fallen into hot grass unconsumed and extravagance of sweetness laid to waste. Each morning she takes a single plum, bites juice and fruit to pit, then blesses that remnant in her palm, a tiny labyrinth of wild bone, that small permanence. So I'd like to read just a couple of short pieces, and then I'll, um, I think we'll have questions. But um, I am doing a working on a collaborative book with the visual artist Anne Kresge, and her specialty is uh, book arts. And I have a little, ha a little sort of takeaway slip that's where, where the books are. I mean, you can't see very well here, but there's a, it looks like a little star. And this is a prototype of the, of the book. That's one of the shapes that the book will be able to make. And it will be a folded book that all of them are handmade. There'll be a limited edition of, I believe, 100. And um, there's more information in the back. But it's, it's a gorgeous little project. She's massively gifted. And, and I have the honor of creating the text that goes inside. And the inspiration of it 
is this series of shapes and what their symbology is, how the role that these certain shapes have played in different cultures and spiritual practice and, in, and at certain spiritual sites. So I'll read a few pieces out of that. And they're titled just by the shape. And then once the book is finished, there will also be a list of kind of the... Um, the colors and the minerals and the things that are also associated with this certain shape. And the first shape is the square. Sometimes I don't have the heart to walk among the living. Others seem so sure in their sepia robes, talking of earth's pleasures and sorrows, the olive trees leaning to listen. At these times in silence and noon light, I walk a labyrinth it's winding within four walls, identity a carapace of great weight. Circle. In a blue pool, one of us wades, the pond ringing ankle bones in concentric halos. Iridescent fish whirl in their schools of ablution. The lost one, wounded and voiceless, wears nine bracelets in a clutch of days. Memory is silver, the future copper, and each alternates to the elbow. The present is in the skin. Oval. The mirror is obscured. I cannot clearly see how real the distortions. A voice says, look up. A voice says, Leave the glass. Sunlight waits in the agate bed to encourage the pilgrims on their way. Tiny flowers breathe joy from their vaginal mouths. All of existence is speaking. Use other eyes and see. Crescent. I gaze into a white bowl. What can it hold? Water, fire, umber, umber soil, crystals of samarium, the many names of God, slips of paper with scrawled fortunes, silicon chips, garnet beads, and, and blades of fine grass. Can it hold the unweighable soul like a cube of sugar on the tongue of a sparrow? flame. I might speak from fear or brokenness or from violet contentment. I might wake to my life in the night, calling out a holy list of flaming syllables in such a quiet voice. Our hope is resilient here, the blue jewel at the center of each petal of flame. Thank you. When I read your, your collection, I um, saw it, but I would not have dared refer to the early poems as dark. But as you read them, particularly the poems about the children, mm -hmm. the true power of those poems uh, came out after the poem, when there was an aura mm -hmm. in the room. There was deathly quiet, mm -hmm. there was not a sound. The power of the poem and the feelings of the children, they just carried on which is an extraordinary experience for me oh. as a reader and a listener. But what you did also is you read my favorite poem of the collection. Oh, wonderful. The one about the movies. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, it's, it's funny. It's something that young people will have to Google now. Yes. <laughs> but there's also a dark use to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was the lovely balance that I found. Mm. Thanks for reading my thing. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm honored that that's your reaction. Thank you. Yes? Well, a two-part question. Uh -huh. Who would you say influenced you? And the second part, who do you like to read? Oh, I hate this question. Um, <laughs> 
I hate this question because I'm really an omnivore. Um, there are poets that are I always come back to. I always come back to Rilke. I always come back to Salon. I always come back to Neruda. I always come back to Sharon Olds. Um, I love Rethke. He was really important to me early on. Um, but I, I go through little phases of being passionate about a poet and then kind of dropping them and going to the next one. So currently, I'm very interested in Henri Cole. Um, I'm finding him really fascinating. And I really enjoyed um, Emily Kendall Fry's um, Sorrow Arrow. I think that's sort of a puzzling and amazing book. Um, and I, primarily what I do is when the major awards come out, I start reading those books and then keep going back to sort of the, the, the what do you call it, the riverbed, the grounding of kind of the classic people, you know, Bishop and um, I guess anybody you'd find in the Norton Anthology, to be frank. <laughs> so, um, but also, I mean, Lee Young Lee was really important to me. Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton were hugely important to me. I love Joy Harjo. Every time she has a new book come out, I get really excited. And so that would basically be the answer. Yeah, it's, I'm all over the place. And I'm also a poetry book hoarder. It's a little bit of an illness, so, yeah. My husband has no idea how much money I'm spending on Amazon, so. That's our secret. Shh. Oh, don't. <laughs> He'll never watch this. <laughs> He's a soccer player. <laughs> Sure. So I'll read the last little bit. Some throw sand until the air is alive with it, and the figure holds out his hands to Lazarus, and the figure walks across the sand to meet him halfway. Welcome, someone says into his bandaged ear, and the crowd gathers its fear like a tool of the field and goes to work. That's another manuscript that I'm working on. Um, I, I'm trying to get comfortable with writing, I guess, somewhat autobiographically. I don't really love it. It doesn't hold my attention in the way that other things do. And it feels, I, feel, I find that it's hard to um, detach from the, from the attachment to what actually happened. And then you really get into trouble as an artist, I think. But that is from that upcoming collection that's um, based on childhood. Mm -hmm. Do you have a process? Do you write every morning? Do you write every day? Do you have a favorite pen, a favorite book? I wish that I wrote every day. I'm a little bit stuck. Um, I tend to write in sort of big rushes. Uh -huh. And I wish that I had a daily practice. I think that would work much better, and I, I aspire to that, but I've not gotten there. And I have to say that I'm a little bit spoiled. I write in a writing studio. You can actually see it on my website if you look uh, www.dondiazwillis.com. My husband took like a, an old ratty um, garden shed, and he turned it into a writing studio with windows and heat and a desk. And yeah, it's good. I mean, yeah, and it, so it doesn't have air conditioning, so the summer is a little bit tough, but open the windows and it's okay. Yeah. I appreciate your uh, mentioning Lucille Clifton and Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, they come from a particular era that uh, was a different generation uh, mm -hmm. in America. Um, any influence by Audre Lorde? Uh, I do love Audre Lorde very much. Very complex. Mm -hmm. What is it about Lucille Clifton's work? Um, as far as I know, she's noted for the, uh, the conciseness of her work, uh, the simplicity of her work. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me more about Lucille Clifton. Well, I, Lucille Clifton, for one thing, is very much her own poet. So, for example, the way that she owns, she insists on the lowercase letters. She does not do capital letters. Her name is not generally um, printed with capital letters. She insists on that. 
and there's this, there's this deceptive smallness in her poems. They're usually short, the short lines, short in length, but they are like tiny little bombs. That's what I admire about her, is that she writes about human relationship and emotion and society in this quiet little way, but then you get to the end of the poem and it just explodes. Um, so that's what I love about her. Um, and she's just, she's so fierce and she can also be really tender and quiet and, and lovely. Um, and I think that she's in kind of an interesting, and, and Audre Lorde, there's a poem by Audre Lorde, it's one of my favorites, it's, I've taught it for years, it's one of my favorites to teach, which, which is, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the, na on the name of it, but it has this refrain, and mother's in the bedroom with the door closed, with, written from the point of view of this adolescent girl um, and how she's kind of in this quiet crisis about hitting adolescence and then her mother is clearly in, in a depression locked away and she it's beautifully done. And then Gwendolyn Brooks I feel like is such an interesting sort of counterweight to Lucille Clifton in the, in the formality and her really um, remarkable ability to to write in form in a way that feels really vibrant and alive and continues to weather time. Sometimes formalists don't age well, you know, but I think that she's someone who does. I appreciate you making that articulation because now it, it illuminates for me your poetry because it seems like you would carry, a, in your poems, you carry a thought either for a couplet, a tercet, or a quatrain, mm -hmm. but you're constantly changing out mm -hmm. of those particular patterns as opposed to one mm -hmm. stream of thought, and that points out to the conciseness of what's so mm -hmm. powerful. I, I really, um, f creating the form of the poem, I think, is one of the hardest parts to really try to make it organic to the poem, and she's somebody who is really a master at that. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the key to your use of the religious content, various terms and stories and traditions. And that might be an obvious question, but I don't mean it to be obvious. Uh, what is it, obviously, that makes, you keep coming back to it. Yes. So what's the effect? Well, I think there's multiple attractions. Um, I, I would, there was a time in my life when I definitely would have um, described myself as Christian. Not that I would not do that now, but I'm a little more have a little more complicated relationship, I guess, with that term. I'm not totally comfortable to own it in that way. I feel like it's a much more private thing now than it once was. Um, but also, I'm really interested in the way that those stories are so, I mean, the Old Testament and the New Testament are infused in our culture and in our literature. And if you don't know those stories, you're really missing out on a lot of the nuance of so much literature. Um, and so I'm interested in how those stories can still be meaningful also. Um, I think that the reason that those stories have lasted are not just people's belief, but it's, it, you know, it's like Shakespeare and the Greek myths and everything else, that there's this human resonance that is timeless and, um, and enlivening and um, helps us to really contemplate what it is to be a good human or not a good human or to live a good life or not. So um, for me, those, those stories are, are a wonderful focus for kind of archetypes about situations and predicaments and challenges that, that we might face. Did your father's mm -hmm. uh, biological father, you said he was a Christian, or... <coughs> No, uh, he was a Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. Did that influence some of your writing? No. Mm -mm. No, in fact, I, I mean, he was on, on the scene and then out of the scene really early on, but it was just sort of this background time. And then there was this childhood story that I had, that was literally that I had pneumonia and there was a wrestling about whether or not we were going to go to the hospital because they needed to pray me out of it or think me out of it or whatever it was. And I think that was really the beginning of the end of the marriage at that point. So, yeah, that would be hard to reconcile if you didn't. <laughs> so. John will be here for a while. Mm -hmm. There are some books back here uh, to my right. Oops. 
Sylvie uh, for purchase and please have some refreshments. Take some with you if you would like. That's what they're for. Let's give Don another hand. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much.